In this lecture, we are going to be looking at chapter six, the Etruscans. Um, the Etruscans occupied the middle of Italy in the early Roman days. And so what we're gonna look, this is almost gonna be a slight transitional period, not necessarily from the Greeks to the Romans, but the Etruscans did exist at the same time as some of the, as Greece. Um, but we're gonna see eventually the Romans will wipe them out. Again, they occupied the middle of Italy in early Roman days. Often uh, Etruscan art was kind of looked at as debased Greek art or bad Greek art, but that view has changed and it's now seen and valued as its own unique style. Um, some examples are they had very lavishly decorated tombs before the Greeks ever did, and also were creating fresco paintings before this technology was found in Greece. Uh, interesting, Etruscan priests studied the flight patterns of birds to predict the future. And so you'll see a couple times in your readings talk about landscape and animal life shown. And the Etruscan art and architecture was unquestionably providing models for early Roman painters, sculptures, and architects. Now, where this area was, it's the territory between the Arno and the Tiber rivers in central Italy. And in fact, it's still known today. The area is known as Tuscany, which comes from the Etruscans. Uh, the region centered on Florence. Now, the language of the Etruscans is interesting. It was written in a Greek-derived script, but was unrelated to Indo-European linguistic family, and largely it remains undeciphered. And there's also debate over whether if the Etruscans were natives of Italy or if they were a people of immigrants, meaning they traveled there. And we really don't know, but what is pretty universally uh, agreed upon is that eventually it be, they became a combination of both, both native Italians and uh, immigrants who had come in. And this was done during the first millennium BCE. And this was called the Villanova Age. And now this occurred at the same time as the geometric period in Greece. They were related, but distinct from other Italian peoples. They never unified as an alliance or an alliance of city-states like other areas we've looked at. And so it's why we don't call them a dynasty or a kingdom. And what it's usually known as Etruria for the area that they occupied. All right, so we're gonna begin with early Etruscan art. And what makes this maybe a little more confusing is art historians usually divide the history of Etruscan art into periods that mirror those of Greek art. So they're gonna have the same names and maybe a few similarities, but they are not the same thing. So for example, we'll start with the seventh century BCE in the Orientalizing art period. Also, we're going to have the Archaic, Classic, and Hellenistic periods. But beginning with the Orientalizing art in the 7th century BCE, the Etruscans themselves mined iron, tin, copper, and silver, and because of this, they created great wealth for themselves. Prosperous cities grew and engaged in international commerce, and wealthy Etruscans had this desire and wanted foreign goods. So we're gonna see some of these influences from these outside areas show up in art. An example is what we're looking at here. This is the fibula from the Regolini uh, Glassica uh, tomb, uh, though it's Italian pronunciations, it's named after the excavators who found it. And this was a tomb of a woman, and it contained this fibula, which we see here. And what that was, or is, is a clasp or pin, and this was used to fasten a woman's gown at the shoulder. Now, the large disc shape is in the Italic, uh, Italic tradition. However, if you look at the large disc, there's five lions on the surface. And this actually was a motif that originated in the Orient. Also in the tomb were other large gold jewelry pieces showing the wealth of the family. And then other examples we have, this is considered part of the archaic art and architecture is where we look at the Etruscan temples. Now due to the materials that were used to build them, usually only the foundations have survived. Also we know from the foundations that have survived is the Etruscans laid out their towns according to a rational grid plan, which you can see in the image on the left. 
Now the information we know is from the remaining foundations, but also from the Roman architect of Vitruvius's treatise on architecture. In fact, he has a chapter on Etruscan temples. So in the 6th century BCE, the temples did resemble the Greek stone gabled roof temples, but the Etruscan ones had wood columns. Also, their roofs were tile-covered timbers, and the walls were made of sun-dried bricks, and as we've talked about before, those eroded over time. Now, entrance was only possible through a narrow staircase at the center of the front. Now, this created a strong frontal design where this is, you knew where the entrance in the front was, and then these temples would usually sit on a high stone podium, and the stone podium is usually all that remains. Also making them different from the Greek temples, where the Greek temples were often a 1 to 2 ratio, the typical ratio of the Etruscan temples was 5 to 6. Also, columns were only used in the front of the temple, and the columns were Tuscan columns, meaning they were made of wood, they were unfluted, and had bases. And then also what's interesting is pedimentary statuary was rare in Etruria. They did place life-size narrative statue along the roof ridges of the temples rather than in the pediments, and these were actually made of terracotta instead of stone. An example of this sculpture, of life-size sculpture, is the Apollo of Ve, circa 510 to 500 BCE. This is painted terracotta and it's 5 feet 11 inches high. And this is considered the finest surviving Etruscan temple statue. This was a life-size image of Apula, or one of their gods, which they believe is mirrored in Apollo in uh, both Greek and Roman gods. This image, or the statue, was one of at least four statues on top of the temple at Ve, and it's popularly called the Apollo of Ve. It is believed it may have been created by Volca of Ve, who was the most famous Etruscan sculpture at the time, but we have no formal evidence of this. Like the Greek art, this would have been brightly painted. However, there are several key things that separate it from Greek art of the time. Here we see this vigorous striding motion uh, that we can see he's clearly in, in, in motion and in moving. Uh, the gesticulating arms, almost as if you know, he's talking to you, uh, the fan-like calf muscles, the rippling clothing, and the very animated face. This made it very different from the Greek art of the time. Another example of statuary work that shows difference from the Greek is the other image here, and this is a servitary sarcophagus, circa 520 BCE. If you're not sure, sarcophagus uh, is where you would put um, the, the remains of the dead. This is also painted terracotta, and it's three feet nine and a half inches tall by six feet seven inches in length. Again, this was a painted terracotta terracotta sarcophagus found in a tomb and it contained only ashes and we don't know if it was the husband the wife or both uh, and uh, cremation was actually the most common means of disposing of the dead now this was made it was created in four different sections that were cast and fired and then put together into the hole now at this time we have this a very elaborate decorated sarcophagus in the etruscan tombs and in Greece during this time, Greek tombs were not elaborate at this time. And this also, the subject matter is showing something different than what we saw in Greece. This shows a husband and wife dining at a banquet. And remember, this was something that was not seen in Greek art at all. Also, it's not stiff or formal. It's much more lifelike, but not realistic. This is not a portrait of the individuals. Also, the proportions are off. And you can tell this very clearly when we look at the transition to the torso, from the torso to the waist, it's very unnatural. It's almost like a 90 degree angle there. Now this was found in the Bandicachi uh, necropolis. Remember necropolises were the cities of the dead. Um, beginning in the 7th century BCE, wealthy Etruscan families built large tombs in the form of a mound. Now, we did see this design earlier in the Mycenae Greece period. 
Many ancient civilizations did not allow burial inside the city, so these necropolises, the city of the dead, were created. So the Etruscans' tombs, they actually built tombs that mirrored the layout and furnishings of the Etruscan houses of the living. Often they were highly decorated by gouging the tombs out of bedrock itself, and you can see that in the upper left image. And the walls were often covered with reliefs. And you can see that in the other example here. So the carving is from the tomb of reliefs, late 4th century, early 3rd century BCE. And the bottom right is the tomb of the leopards, so named so by the leopard images that are guarding the door. And this is circa 480 BCE. And again, you see these very elaborate paintings and decorations. Now the tomb of the leopards, what the relief is showing, it's, it's actually an outdoor banquet with a very joyful tone, meaning it's celebrating the good life of the Etruscan privileged elite. Uh, something that comes up a couple times both in this and in the sarcophagus, you'll see a figure holding an egg, and this is a symbolic reference to rebirth in the afterlife. And so you can see these very elaborate tombs that were created at the time. Now, these tombs were not for everybody. These tombs would only be able to be afforded by the very wealthy and elite Etruscans. Now, when we move to later Etruscan art, what we're going to see is we're going to see more of the Roman influence. The Romans actually expelled the last of the Etruscan kings in 509 BCE and replaced the monarchies with a republican form of government. In 474 BCE, allied Greek forces won a victory over the Etruscan fleet, and basically this ended the Etruscan dominance in the area. And because of this, it was also an end of the wealthy Greek elite. This is also considered the classical art period, and what we saw in this was the number of the elaborate tombs created declined rapidly, which makes sense, right? The wealthy elite were gone, so people could not afford them. However, the Etruscans had um, excelled in casting sculptures, both in the hollow bronze and terracotta, and we do see continue these artworks being made, but again, they're fewer in number. An example of this is what we're looking at here. This is the Chimera of Arezzo, circa 4th century BCE. It is a bronze, and it's 2 feet 7.5 inches high. And it's called this because it was found at Arezzo in 1553. It's, in, it's an inscribed Tenzinsville, which is Etruscan for gift to the god Tenia, uh, indicating it was a votive offering, meaning it was created as a gift to the god. Now, what's interesting, again, we see the Greek and Roman influence because the Chimera was a monster of Greek invention. It is a lion's head and body with a serpent's tail. But you can see in this, right, this sense of action within the work, like right? even the face of the Chimera. And then we're going to move on to the last period, which is the Hellenistic art and the rise of Rome. Again, Rome continues to take over most of Etria, and you see this influence very strongly in the art. Uh, we see this in the Porta Marisa in the 2nd century BCE. And what happens was the Etruscans of, of Perugia formed an alliance with Rome. And so because of this alliance, they were actually spared from destruction. And what this is, is this is part of the wall and gates of the city still stand. And the Portia Marisa, which is the gates of Mars, were actually preserved, the upper part of it. Uh, here you can see the arch in the lower half. This is a series of trapezoidal stone voussoirs held in place by being pressed against each other, and this forms an archway. The center stone is called the keystone, and this is going to become very important because Italy, first under the Etruscans and later under the Romans, is where freestanding triumphal arches became a major architectural type, and we will explore this even more in the next chapter. And then finally, the last work that we're going to look at is the Al Metalli. And this was early 1st century BCE bronze. It's 5 feet 7 inches. And this is one of the latest extant works, meaning one of the oldest existing works or latest, produced for an Etruscan patron. However, we're going to see it's very highly Roman in style. Now, it shows the magistrate, um, Ale Matella, addressing the assembly. 
However, during this time period, the social war ended in 89 BCE. And at that time, all of Italy's inhabitants were given Roman citizenship. And this work reflects that. When we look at him, he is wearing the short toga and laced lace boots of a Roman magistrate. And so this work actually reflects the Romans' complete domination of the Etruscans. And from this, we'll move into the Roman Empire.